Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor Vignette Series. And we are going to dive into one of the most feared subjects in orthopedic advanced MR imaging, and that is the labrum, instability, and macro instability. I'd like to start out with a, a little bit of freelance drawing. As you may know, I'm not a professional artist, but uh, let's, take a, uh, let's take a run at this. So let's start out with a, uh, a simple axial view of the humeral head. And then anteriorly, let's uh, draw in the, the bicipital groove. And within the bicipital groove sits the biceps long head tendon. Then we have the, the glenoid cup. And the glenoid cup should hug like, like a goblet with a tennis ball in it lying on its side, should hug the humeral head. The amount of excursion of the glenoid cup around the humeral head varies. But one thing we know is that it's insufficient in everybody because the shoulder is the joint that dislocates with the greatest frequency. So when we were constructed, evolved, formed, whatever, this relationship was not optimal. Still, you should see the anterior labrum head around the humeral head and try and curl into it to hold it in place. And the same thing is true in the posterior labrum. Later on, we're going to talk about things like the depth of the cup, the relationship of the curvature of the humeral head to the cup. And this relationship should be somewhat conformed. In other words, the radius of curvature of the humeral head should be similar to the concavity of the glenoid cup. Now, so far, we've, we've demonstrated some, some simple characteristics of this relationship, another of which is the center of the humeral head should be about at the same level as the center of the glenoid cup when looking in the, in the axial projection. We'll put the AX for axial. Now, when the humeral head is forward or backward with the patient lying supine, we say that the humeral head is decentered. We'll look at decentering in the coronal projection as well. Now, there are a few additional structures that we have to demonstrate for you the anterior labrum and the posterior labrum. The anterior labrum is going to be a little bit smaller than the posterior labrum superiorly. But as you go from superior to inferior, the anterior labrum gets bigger and the posterior labrum gets smaller. Later on, you're going to see that we refer to this as a labroligamentous complex because off of the anterior labrum and the posterior labrum, ligaments arise and sometimes you can't separate the two. You can't separate where the ligament begins and the labrum stops. And sometimes you can. We have the ligament depicted here in green. And in the back, the ligament depicted here in green as well. You'll see later on that the ligamentous takeoff is very variable in the anterior quadrant. In fact, the higher up we get, the closer it is to the labrum. But when we get lower down, the takeoff may be somewhat medial, maybe over here. But in the back of the shoulder, the takeoff is, is always near the apex. Although sometimes with a floppy labrum, this may distend and fold over on itself and give the impression that, that it arises from the wrong location. But actually what's happening in a situation like this is there's just distension and the labrum is folding over on itself. But in a standard situation, the posterior labrum should take off from, sorry, in, in the standard situation, the posterior capsule should take off from the apex of the labrum. So let's just erase a couple of things here. Our redundant uh, green labroligamentous complex. And then let's draw in some hyaline cartilage. And let's see, what are we going to pick for our hyaline cartilage? If you've got fibrocartilage in blue, You've got ligament in green. You've got the bony contour in red. 
oh, let's pick something interesting like purple. We have hyaline cartilage that lines the surface of the glenoid cup. Now, in the middle, it may be a little thinner, right near this point. And this is called the bare area of the glenoid. And there's also hyaline cartilage on the humeral head. And between these two, I've demonstrated an exaggerated space in white, which represents the joint space, or cavity, which is lined by capsule and synovium, not drawn in. It is common for the hyaline cartilage to slip a little bit underneath the base of the labrum. And this creates a little consternation because the, the cartilage may be a little brighter than the fibrocartilaginous labrum. The hyaline cartilage in purple may be a little brighter. And so it, it may, to the unwary, inexperienced observer, simulate an undersurface tear. But the transition is nice and gradual. There's no inflammation. There are no cysts. And there are no historical or other imaging signs of instability or dislocation. The same thing happens in the back. Sometimes the hyaline cartilage will undercut or slip right underneath the labrum as they transition together. In other instances, the transition is rather abrupt. You know, you go right from hyaline cartilage into fibrocartilage. Now, another caveat. As you proceed from superior to inferior, if you have normal developmental clefts or sulci, they will be larger and more conspicuous in the upper half of the shoulder. So let's draw one of those. And, and they can have a pretty variable depth. So you may have a partial cleft seen here in yellow, or it may go all the way through in the upper quadrant. And you may have a very diminutive labrum, as we said earlier, in the upper quadrant that becomes more robust and then more firmly attached to the underlying structures as you go down. This is a fantastic rule when you're trying to assess what's a tear and what is a developmental abnormality. The variations are going to be above the humeral and glenoid equator. The true tears the flap tears, the partial thickness tears, the bankert lesions are going to be below the equator of the humeral head and the glenoid. Now in the back, this is a less consistent phenomenon. In fact, in the back, we don't like to see any deep clefts, although we will see the purple hyaline cartilage undercutting the posterior labrum. It is very common to see small tears and separations of the ligament, little tiny separations of the green ligament from the underlying blue labrum in patients that participate in contact sport and lift weights. The humeral head is constantly being forced backwards and it may produce these little rents over time, which may be symptomatic but are more often asymptomatic. So golden rule number one, variations in the relationship of the labrum relative to clefts and sulci and flaps are inconsistent and are much more common in the axial projection in the upper quadrant. And as you, as you achieve lower quadrant status below the equator, they go away and they should not be present. Golden rule number two, the relationship of the labrum to the underlying bone with regard to clefts is far more consistent posteriorly, where the clefts are nominal to non-existent in the normal setting, but don't confuse a cleft for hyaline cartilaginous undercutting. Finally, Golden rule number three, the relationship of the ligamentous complex to the labral size is inverse. Larger, thicker, more well-developed 
ligamentous complex, smaller labrum. Bigger labrum, thinner ligamentous complex. Three golden rules. And finally, I'll finish with one last caveat. When you're initially assessing your scalp or your series of axial images that you've obtained for purposes of evaluating the instability syndromes, you should always look at the relationship between the anterior and the posterior bony glenoid labrum. They should be relatively congruent with regard to their medial lateral position. If one of them is more laterally oriented than the other, then we have a situation of incongruence. And if the anterior portion, and we'll pick a color to draw it in, if the anterior portion is sticking all the way out here in pink relative to the posterior portion, we will make a measurement like this, which we'll talk about later on, and we'll achieve some angle measurements, and this is known as retroversion. If, on the other hand, let's take our eraser and get rid of all this stuff. If, on the other hand, the posterior labrum has a large posterior structure relative to the anterior labrum, we say that the state of antiversion exists. Developmentally, retroversion with insufficiency of the posterior glenoid is much more common. With osteoarthritis, it's the opposite. The anterior labrum is going to be overdeveloped relative to the posterior labrum, and you'll see the humeral head sag posteriorly. You'll see later on that sometimes these osteophytes, anterior and anteroinferiorly, have some very cute names. Okay, that, that concludes our initial introduction into labro-ligamentous anatomy, macro-instability, and the golden rules, the three golden rules, with some caveats that have been intertwined with those golden rules. But of all the things we've discussed, those three golden rules you should carry away from this mentor vignette. Thank you.